Hello and welcome to Daily Debrief, the international news primer brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya and in this episode, we'll be talking about protests in Kazakhstan, knighthood for Tony Blair and arrests of opposition leaders in Tunisia. We start with Kazakhstan, which continues to be in the throes of a crisis. Violent protests have rocked the country over the past few days with the city of Almaty at their center. Peacekeeping forces from the collective security treaty organization have arrived in the country. The protests began over rising fuel prices and continued despite the demands of the protesters being met. The protests are also being viewed in the context of the larger geopolitical crisis in the region. We have with us Prashant for more. Prashant, could you give us a quick update on the genesis of this protest and the developments? Right, Pragya. So uh, it's still it, it's uh, it's still a very crisis-ridden situation right now, as far as we understand in Kazakhstan. Of course, a lot of media reports coming, a lot of videos coming. Of course, of <clears throat> the kind of protests that have been taking place. The origin of these protests is uh, actually stems from when price controls were removed on liquefied petroleum gas, and now LPG is a very important uh, resource in Kazakhstan because a lot of people depend on LPG to fuel their cars. And when the price controls were removed, what happened was that the price of LPG basically doubled. And this uh, led to some protests, especially in what is called the Mangistau region, which is the oil rich uh, region. This is where a lot of the oil resources are. So that is where the protests pretty much began. So what seems to have happened is that while the protests uh, seem to have begun over this issue, at some point, a lot of other elements also seem to have crept in into these protests because it does look like there, were, there have been a number of instances of violence at some point. The Almaty airport was attacked, even taken over. A number of public buildings were uh, attacked as well. You know, there was large-scale vandalism. And there are reports of many armed groups also being involved in these, uh, in these incidents, which sort of you know, takes away from the Western media's claim that this is just merely a protest about uh, LPG prices and uh, other issues. And it's important to note that within some days of the protests starting, the president actually ordered the reinstatement of the price controls, which would have brought down the price of LPG. And also the government at the time under the prime minister resigned and resignation was accepted. The president took some other steps as well. So uh, despite all this, the protests seem to have continued and taken a completely different direction. In fact, uh, if you look at some of the demands, and this is something a lot of commentators have pointed out, that some of the demands are a bit outlandish. For instance, there is a claim that Kazakhstan must cut ties with Russia, withdraw from some of those organizations which involve Russia. You know, there has been a demand for the, even some random demands for independence of the Mangistau region itself, which really gives questions, which really leads to questions as to what exactly is really the agenda over here. And of course, a lot of calls for uh, the government to step down. So keeping all this in mind, it's right now a bit difficult to say, as we know, the Forces, the CST or the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is a regional organization, have landed on a peacekeeping mission. The Almaty airport has been uh, taken back. And uh, they see, according to the government sources, at least there is now much more peace and their, their insurgency is being crushed. That's how they're describing it. They're describing them as terrorists. But <clears throat> definitely uh, it does not, you know, there have been certain hints of uh, what has been often called a color revolution in the region here as well, because considering the importance of Kazakhstan. Uh, Prashant, how do we understand these developments in the context of the dynamics of the region itself? The current crisis, which is basically the Russia-Ukraine crisis and the fact that talks are soon about to, start, about to start between Russia and the United States on the issue of Ukraine. So there are many observers who are seeing this as some kind of a pressure tactic in some ways to sort of push, uh, you know, push Russia on the back foot, make, make Russia feel defensive just ahead of the talk. So that's definitely one uh, commentary that has come from many sources. And of course, we also need to see that Kazakhstan's location is very central. It is in Central Asia, of course, but it's also very central to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative as well. So it's also very closely aligned. The ruling establishment is very closely aligned itself with the BRI project, with China, with Russia, and is actually one of the cornerstones of the China-Russia alliance, which has been developing in recent times. So all this, along with the fact that the familiar Western suspects which sort of emerged during every uh, such attempted color revolution have been parroting the demands of, uh, have been parroting many of these demands, which we're again, we're not really clear who are exactly are making these demands, considering the wide range of these demands, it's a bit, you know, uh, uh, all these factors together make the whole timing look a bit suspicious. I mean, 
the, of course, the government of uh, Kazakhstan has followed very neoliberal policies. There's no doubt about that. But the kind of the way things have especially turned over the past uh, couple of days does give cause for a lot of uh, suspicion as well. So that's where we are right now. And I think it's very important also to note that uh, considering the Russia-Ukraine crisis, considering its role in uh, Central Asia, Kazakhstan's role in Central Asia, are we again once again seeing the possibility of another attempt to sort of uh, surround Russia and China, what we call the encirclement of these countries in the past through various ways. We have seen it happen in a number of ways. So are we once again seeing yet another, uh, you know, yet another element of that is really the question that we need to, uh, you know, we need to ask, that we need to, many commentators need to ask. So that's where we are at. Nonetheless, a very important country to be following in the coming days. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Prashant. We now go to Tunisia, where 19 people, including leading opposition figures, will be prosecuted for alleged electoral violations. Those likely to be in the talk include Worker Party's leader Hama Hamami and Hada Party leader Rachid Ganuchi and at least four former prime ministers. They are accused of campaigning during what is called the electoral silence period. Despite this being a legal process, the development is nonetheless being seen through the lens of ongoing political developments in the country. Last year in July, President Kais Said dismissed the government and suspended parliament. He soon suspended parts of the constitution in what is being called a presidential coup. My colleague Prasant spoke to Abdul Rahman of People's Dispatch for more. Thank you, Abdul, so much for joining us. So, as I understand, a number of political leaders, including, of course, the leader of the Workers' Party, Hama Hamami, who was also a presidential candidate in the last election, are apparently going to be, you know, they're going to face legal action because of what is being termed as uh, electoral violations. So could you maybe quickly take us through what the case itself is? Actually, the case is quite minor. Uh, basically, uh, as per the uh, the tribunal which filed the report, it says that uh, these candidates and some of the politicians who also were contesting in, during the parliamentary elections at the time, uh, basically uh, violated the social media rules in which there was a ban on uh, political campaigning. And they also basically campaigned during the time when the, uh, the campaign was prohibited. It means what we call in uh, other places, uh, no campaign day. The, they campaigned during those times, what they call ele election silence. So uh, <clears throat> if the, uh, uh, the court finds them guilty, they, uh, they might have to pay fine. That, that's the only thing uh, which is uh, relevant uh, here. Uh, which is which the fine can go up to uh, 20,000 dinars, uh, which is around $10,000, uh, around $10,000. So uh, the, at the surface, the case looks very uh, uh, minor, in, but uh, there are uh, co genuine concerns raised by uh, parties such as Workers' Party, which sees it uh, this as a part of the political persecution, which is going on uh, in the country uh, of the opposition forces. Uh, they see it as a as an attempt, particularly the Workers' Party, which has uh, uh, which has worked it hard to establish an image of non uh, uh, corrupt uh, pro people uh, uh, party. Uh, if there is uh, there is uh, they, they they say that this is an, an attempt by the government of the uh, Kais Said to kind of portray its uh, the uh, uh, and kind of depoliticize the population at large. So that is their basic concern that they will be seen as part of the larger uh, political uh, establishment, which is perceived by the people uh, by and large as corrupt uh, and uh, which has been involved in a kind of different kinds of political activities, which are non-desirable. So basically it is an attempt to club all the opposition forces together. And that is the basic issue. So one interesting aspect is that uh, the report which named all these opposition leaders also seems to have named President K. Said. But somehow President Kais Said is not part of uh, the people who are going to face any legal action on this. And I think that is one reason some of the parties have also been uh, very vociferous. So could you also tell us how this appears? You all you mentioned this thing of you know clubbing all the opposition into one. So could you also tell us how this sort of fits into the pattern of what Kais Said has been doing ever since he, he basically took over power in July, which has been called by many people as a coup. Technically, the, the, uh, the, there is an explanation given by the uh, 
people who have basically filed the cases and all, they are saying that uh, Kais Saeed cannot be named because he is uh, exempted. Uh, he's, he, has, he has the immunity because he is holding a constitutional post. That is a technical explanation. Otherwise, his name will also be, would have been there because he was also found to be guilty of violating the same kind of laws. But uh, if we see it in the larger picture, uh, uh, basically, uh, um, it's quite clear that uh, uh, <clears throat> the Kais Said, when he basically did what the, the other political parties are calling the political coup in last year, July, in which he suspended uh, the parliament and uh, dismissed the government at the time, calling them corrupt, inefficient, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> basically, it is an attempt it is seen in that uh, context that it is an attempt to basically establish the fact that no political group and no political leader in Tunisia at the moment is basically uh, is eligible or basically is uh, capable of carrying forward the democratic ethos, uh, which is which was the spirit of the uh, uh, 2011 uh, 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 revolution in Tunisia, and therefore it is required. Uh, and 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 this case in particular basically. Uh, uh, is an attempt to prove it that see all of them whether they are a workers party member or whether they are enahada whoever they are they basically all are uh, uh, similarly corrupt they don't have any uh, uh, legitimacy and therefore uh, the what kai said is doing has been doing since last one year, almost like 6 months is basically justified that the the, the political establishment uh, uh, if the parliament, for example, is suspended, there is a genuine reason behind suspending the parliament. Look what they are doing. If uh, uh, we are looking for the change in the constitution, which uh, uh, and, and we are calling for referendum, there is a genuine reason because none of the political uh, leaders are eligible, at the uh, other than the Kais Said, eligible to carry out these kind of constitutional reform. So it is an, an attempt to gain some kind of political legitimacy uh, that as a sole uh, uh, non uh, 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 sole, honest, and eligible leader in the country. So that is a part of the larger political coup, which has been basically uh, 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 pointed out by the opposition leaders in Tunisia and other people. Thank you so much, Abdul. So like Abdul said, what we are seeing is basically an attempt to by, by President Kais Saeed to bunch, every, bunch all the opposition into one particular direction and portray himself as the sole savior of the country. We'll be keeping a close eye on what happens in Tunisia in the coming days as well. Back to you, Pragya. And finally, more than 700,000 people have signed a petition to have former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair's knighthood revoked. Blair was made Knight Companion of the Most Noble Order of the Garter in the Queen's New Year's Honours list. Some are saying that if Blair could get the highest ranking order, then the system that granted it to him must get reviewed. The fresh honour has brought back memories of the many crimes of Tony Blair. We have with us Prashant again. Uh, Prashant, it's not unusual for former Prime Ministers to be honoured in the way Tony Blair has been. Uh, why is this particular case so uh, controversial? Well, Pragya, I think the first question is why does this uh, honour even exist? It's <laughs> He's being given a knighthood uh, in, the 21st, in the 21st century. That itself is... Uh, bizarre. I mean, these are you know the shenanigans of uh, British imperialism and British royalty are things that never cease to astound one. But nonetheless, uh, it's uh, the Morning Star had an interesting editorial which was talking about uh, a recent revelation. We'll come to that later. But one, the last sentence of the editorial was that the nation stands united, and I think what the nation is, seems united about, the country is united about, is in its disapproval of uh, Tony Blair. Apparently, the UK of polls. Show that across sectors, across political, across various sectors of the political spectrum, there is widespread anger over Tony Blair being knighted at this point of time, or any any point of time for that matter. Especially now, this point of time is especially important because this happens just months after Afghanistan, one of the wars Tony Blair led the United Kingdom into. Then, of course, there was the Iraq War, and the Iraq War is especially a very you know. It, it remains a very controversial topic for multiple reasons. One, the fact that Tony Blair and his uh, Labour Party associates played a key role in misleading uh, Parliament, in misleading the British public about the fact that Saddam Hussein uh, supposedly had weapons of mass destruction. You know, there was a dossier which was created, which was later found to be completely inaccurate. 
And obviously, we know that no weapons of mass destruction were ever found. So that's one thing, of course. But uh, I think uh, there, there, and there are a number of other things. The number of people in Iraq who have died, I believe, to have exceeded 1 million post the 2003 war. So that itself is, you know, makes it one of the crimes of the century, so to speak. And I think some time ago, John Pilger, Pilger the journalist writing for, uh, who wrote an article for People's Dispatch, part of the Globe Plotter Network, pointed out that Julian Assange is, you know, very, uh, in the Belmarsh prison where Julian Assange is located is very close to uh, Tony Blair's, uh, you know, home, which is millions of dollars worth of millions of dollars. And the fact that the truth teller is in jail, whereas the war criminal leads uh, lives in a palatial house is actually, I think, something to think about. Now, uh, I think, like I said, one of the inter instructive things is the fact that there has been such widespread condemnation across from people across the political spectrum. Like you said, 700,000 people signing this petition. The numbers probably have increased much more. So I think this is kind of reflective of the public anger over uh, this announcement, which uh, definitely also harks back to 2003 when tens of thousands of people had gathered in London or for that matter in the United States as well in protest. And though the embers of those protests still very much remain in the hearts and minds of the people who even then knew that this was a wrong war, but nonetheless, the British government misled them. Did it have to be Tony Blair who sparks off this uh, sentiment? Why Why him? Right. So uh, I think uh, a couple of things, Pragya. Like I said, coming back to the Iraq war itself, I mean, the destruction that was, uh, the destruction that happened was, it's very difficult to describe because we talked about the 1 million people in Iraq who died. But in terms of infrastructure, in terms of its global impact, the amount, the, for instance, even radicalization of certain sections, all this is a direct product of a war which was waged on false premises. That's very important to remember. That's one aspect, of course. The second aspect is the fact that uh, there was very, there were, there was, you know, the, whole, the way the whole uh, war was planned itself, it's such an insult to the idea of democracy. And there's been uh, Blair's, I think, former Defense Secretary Geoff Hoon in his uh, autobiography, his memoirs, has now stated that he his staff was ordered to destroy a note from the Attorney General at that time who basically said that this was, uh, you know, there was no legal grounds for the war. And this uh, revelation has once again, I think, angered much, much more people at this point of time when this uh, award was announced. And the fact that Tony Blair got a free check, for lack of a better word, I mean, he destroyed, uh, he played a role in destroying two countries along with George Bush, many, uh, many other, uh, you know, people across the lives of people across the world as well, uh, was, part, was, part, was part, was complicit in all the war crimes that followed. And after that, when he left his prime ministership, he was again, you know, he made millions advising uh, uh, leaders, you know, corrupt leaders across the world. Uh, he was part of something called the Quartet, which was asked to find solutions to various crises, uh, you know, which is like the heights of irony, considering that he was responsible for the crisis itself. So I think, uh, you know, what a lot, and in fact, uh, while a lot of people do say that Tony Blair's uh, time as prime minister of Britain was good for Britain itself, there has been also a lot of reporting which shows that he played a vital role in bringing the kind of policies which were taken for, uh, further by the conservative government and which have led Britain to its crisis today. You know, one where the NHS is under threat, one where, you know, the, uh, there is so much austerity policies. So a lot of the foundation for a lot of this was laid during Tony Blair's time as well, because, uh, you know, he was somebody who wanted to build a new Labour Party, take it away from the original roots of lay the Labour Party, which lay in trade unionism, which lay in movements of the left, and position it as some kind of a neoliberal market-friendly force as well. So uh, I think those all these um, all these are multiple factors which feed into sort of visceral response that has emerged after Tony Blair, uh, the, this announcement came. But I think the most important thing is definitely the Iraq war, because that was a complete slap. It is a complete insult to the British people in multiple ways, not to mention and that's, that's the reason for domestic anger, not to mention the global ramifications. I don't think the people of Iraq are going to be amused. Uh, we saw uh, long time itself when Muntadar al-Zaidi uh, threw his shoes at George Bush, which is an iconic moment. It reflected a lot of people, you know, what a lot of people felt. And uh, I don't know what people might be <laughs> feeling about Tony Blair in Iraq today. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious to guess what they might be feeling, but... Yeah, I think all that uh, sort of brings it together.
And that is all we have today on Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. Please keep watching People's Dispatch and follow us and like us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you.